Welcome to Life Hacker's Evil episode. Today we are going to crack a padlock. We are going to make quick work of assholes with text expansion, and we're also going to learn how to get student discounts forever. We're going to build a Hackintosh Mac and hide files inside other files. And we are going to find out who's unfriended you on Facebook, and of course, the downloads of the day. So without any further ado, let's stick it to the man. Out of 64,000 combinations, we've always heard that with a systematic approach, you can narrow that down to 100 for master padlocks. Uh, so what you'll need to crack a padlock is, of course, the padlock. Uh, this is a padlock that I own that I lost the combination to years ago. And uh, you don't need this, but it's helpful to have a friend. Howdy. First thing you're going to do is apply pressure up on the padlock's uh, clasp, and then start turning. And every time the every time the padlock locks into a spot, you're going to write down that number. So let's do that. What's in? It's about one, about five, eight, about eleven. Once you make it through the dial, you should be left with twelve numbers that it caught at. So take seven of those numbers and they'll be those about numbers, the numbers that weren't quite on the line. Throw those numbers out, you should be left with five numbers. Of these five remaining numbers, four of them will have the same digit as the last digit. So in our example, it was eight, 18, 28, and 38. Throw all those out and you should be left with one number, which Whitson is? 22. So 22 is the last number in our padlocks combination. This is the trial and error step in the process. Basically, you're going to need a table, something like this. This uh, you can find on the link on your screen. And you're going to go through this table, and you'll see a bunch of numbers. And you want to find the number for your padlock in the bottom row. In this case, mine's 22, so I'm in this third grouping of numbers. And then, essentially, you have to go through every possible combination of the first two with your number. So, Whitson, why don't you get me started, and we'll start flying through these. All right. Uh, first combination is 2022. Nope. 2222. Nope. 302222. Nope. 301622. Here we go. So that little trick worked to help me get into my padlock. Uh, use it for good, kids. So you got me into text expansion. Yeah. Yeah. So what's that about? So text expansion utilities are basically small utilities that allow you to type short pieces of text and they will expand to larger pieces of text. So if you're regularly typing your phone number, your address, you can create a little shortcut, say comma CP for cell phone that will expand to your cell phone number. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've developed one called Texter for Windows. There's another one, Text Expander for Mac. You have a favorite on yeah, the Mac? Yeah, I like snippets. So yeah, that's the basics. Okay, so Adam got me hooked on this and I like uh, I, I found that you know when you get messages from mean people uh, or people who are just temporarily uh, temporary assholes, you can type in comma asshole and it will expand to a canned response and you put in whatever canned response you want. But basically, you type out a polite email. But when you type comma asshole, you get to call them an asshole while still being polite, and it expands into a message you can send them. So it addresses the problem. But this isn't a default. You have to create your own asshole message. Yeah, of course. And the nice part, of course, is that you're a nice guy, mm -hmm. but it gets really difficult to send a lot of yeah. nice emails to people who are being mean to you. Mm -hmm. So you get that kind of nice aspect of getting to type asshole, <laughs> but then it replaces it to something that's actually kind of friendly. Yeah. So everybody wins. Yeah, and then every time I've used this, it's been really helpful because they usually write back and they're apologetic and they, you know, sometimes people just don't realize that there's someone, like a real human being on the other end of that email account. So they write back with a more polite response and you can have some decent conversations after that. I love it.
So, Whitson, you just graduated college, right? I did. Yeah, and you probably got some good student discounts. Got some great student discounts. Yeah, those days are over. I know. Yeah, so if you want to keep getting student discounts, and I think that it's reasonable to do that if you have some flexible ethics, um, you can still do that with your student ID afterwards because you have more of a financial burden after you graduate. I mean, even if you're not paying off college loans, you're still having to get a job and you don't have a lot of money. You have no support from either your loans or your family or whatever the case may be. Absolutely. Yeah, so this is when you need your discount the most. Now, I have a student ID card here, and mine uh, will get me lots of student discounts. They used to have date tracking on the back through stickers. And I don't have those stickers anymore because I don't go to school anymore. So I just took them off, and most places don't really care that you have those ID stickers on the ID. But you have a different situation, right? It is. My expiration date is actually printed on the front of the card. Yeah, so in this case, you can scan this into Photoshop or something, and then just uh, change the date so it's a couple years later. Or... As long as you're ordering online, they're just asking for a scan of your card. And exactly. You anything. Yeah. A lot of places will also only ask for a, a .edu email address, which most schools will let you keep afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like if you want a free Amazon Prime account yeah. for a year or a discounted copy of Windows. Yeah. Um, and a lot of places, like the Apple Store, don't even ask for a student ID. You just tell them what college you supposedly go to and they'll give you a discount on anything in their online store. Yeah, it's kind of like sneaking movie theater or food into a movie theater. Uh, because you end up, you know, they don't really check as long as you just... It's just like that. Yeah, so um, if you want to get some discounts, uh, it's really easy to do so. So as long as you're okay with uh, kind of breaking the rules a little bit, you can get your student discounts forever. You can go out and buy a Mac like this one, and you'll spend a pretty good chunk of change, you'll get a pretty good computer. But... If you want a little more customizability, uh, a little more bang for your buck, you can build your own Mac, which we call a Hackintosh, and it's actually not that hard. Here's a quick look at how it works. Before you get started building your Hackintosh, you will, of course, need a few supplies. First, the hardware. There's no such thing as a definitive Hackintosh build, and you can find plenty of hardware that will run OS X using this or a similar method. In my build, I'm using this Antec Sonata 3 case with a 500 watt power supply, an Asus P7P55DE Pro motherboard, an EVGA GE Force 9500 video card, an Intel Core i7 2.8 GHz processor, four 2 GB sticks of RAM for a total of 8 GB, an OCZ Vertex series solid state drive, a second internal hard drive, and a DVD writer. In all, the subtotal on Newegg for all that hardware for me was $1,123.92. Skip the SSD and the second set of RAM, and you've still got a solid machine for $828.92. Once you've got all your hardware, you'll need to assemble your computer. Putting together the hardware for your Hackintosh is just like building any other computer from scratch. You mount the motherboard to your case, install your CPU, your RAM, graphics card, storage, and optical drive, and plug in all the necessary cables. It's always a good idea to read over your motherboard's instruction manual, but if you want a little more help, search Lifehacker for our first timer's guide to building a computer from scratch. Now for the software. On the software end of the spectrum, you'll need a few things. Apart from the obvious, the Snow Leopard install DVD, you'll need to download some files that contain the tools that will let you install OS X on your machine. Here's all the software you'll need. A Mac OS X 10.6 install DVD, a Mac OS X combo update, iBoot from Tony Mac, MultiBeast also from Tony Mac, and a handful of other post-installation files which you can download from a link on Lifehacker. Once you've got your hardware and software together, you're ready to create your Hackintosh. For a walkthrough of the entire installation process, hop on over to Lifehacker for further instructions. Encrypting or password protecting a file with today's computers isn't all that hard, but doing it in such a way that nobody even knows there's something there to be seen, that's a little more fun and trickier. Here's how to use steganography tools to hide your files in plain sight. Encrypting a secret thing inside a plain thing is called steganography. It dates back more than 500 years. It's sneakier than straight up encryption because it looks like you've got nothing to hide. Want to embed your own secret messages? All you need is a computer and some free software. We're going to use a free tool for Windows called WB Stego, but there are lots of options out there. Fire up the app, hit continue, and then choose encode. 
It asks you for the data you want to hide. I've created a text file with a location of a key I'm trying to give to Whitson. I'll just drag it in here to select it. Then I'll choose the type of file I want to hide it inside. In this case, a PDF. It's the uh, Photoshop README file. Hit continue. And then I have to choose my encryption. There's a lot of them, but I'm going to go with Twofish, a encryption I know to be pretty strong. I have to type in a password that I gave to Whitson, maybe in a folded up newspaper. Type it out twice, hit OK, and then hit continue. It asks me for a uh, file that I want to drop it into. I'm going to use the same PDF, then hit OK, and I'm all done. For Whitson to get my message, he'll also need to launch WP Stego. When he does, he'll have to choose decode, drag in the PDF I sent him, the supposed PDF from Photoshop, and I'll have to type in that password that I gave him in a folded up newspaper. Hits continue. It chooses a place that he wants the message to go. Maybe create a new text file called Whitson Message. He refers to himself in the third person, apparently. Hit continue, and there it is. Now when he opens it up, he can see where the key is and visit me at any time. Kind of creepy, actually. There are lots of other ways to be sneaky in plain sight. On Windows, Mac, even on mobile platforms. Search for Stego or Steganography tools and you should find a whole bunch. Go ahead and hide your deepest secrets inside boring looking, almost tax like documents and nobody's the wiser. Lifehacker, how do I find out who's unfriended me on Facebook? So we've all been there before. You get in a fight with one of your friends and they do the unthinkable and unfriend you on Facebook. Unfortunately, Facebook doesn't actually notify you of when this happens. Luckily, there is a simple extension for almost any browser that will let you know when someone's unfriended you on Facebook. It's called Unfriend Finder. And all you need to do is install it into your browser. And then after you've installed the extension, whenever someone unfriends you on Facebook, you'll get a notification. Defriend Whitson. Mm, yep. Unfortunately, this extension only tells you who's unfriended you after you've installed the extension, so it won't show you any past unfriend requests. Um, so install it now or install it when you foresee getting into a fight with someone and you'll be okay. It's that time again, downloads of the day. So let's see what we've got for evil downloads. First up, we have Backtrack, which can help you crack Wi-Fi web passwords. Visit the link on your screen and we'll explain more about how this works. Next, we have Offcrack, which is a brute force password cracker for Windows. Lastly, we have FireSheep, which is a Firefox extension that can capture network activity on open Wi-Fi networks. That means you can pick up passwords and usernames of people logging into Facebook and other services. Of course, it's illegal to capture this information, but we know that you'll use this to just learn about it and protect yourself and not use it for evil. So as you can see, a little evil goes a long way. We'll see you in hell.